Pirates is one of the earliest attractions designed for Disneyland, but it was going to be a wax museum. You'd walk through and see static scenes of great moments in pirate mythology. Originally, it was part of New Orleans Square. This is what we call New Orleans Square. All these little streets are gonna be very intriguing, little shops and things. And, and here's a picture of it from the riverfront as it will look when it's finally finished. They cleared out the area at Disneyland where New Orleans Square would be, dug a giant hole in the ground for the basement because actually all the attractions are down underground underneath New Orleans. And once the steel was up, they stopped because Walt Disney had become involved in the New York World's Fair. The New York World's Fair was really important in the development of uh, Disney theme park shows because by that time we'd been handling, for example, in It's a Small World with a Boat Ride, over 3,000 people an hour, which is an enormous challenge. They sat down after the fair and tried to figure out how to adapt these boats to the pirate's building. Turns out to get the boats down into the basement and get the boats back up out of the basement took up all the space they had. So they said, well, Walt, what do you want us to do with that already existing basement? And he said, well, make it into caves or something like that. Suddenly, it's nighttime, and you're in the swamps and the bayous, and you're, you've got these boats going by. So you're instantly transformed into a magical place. And there's a sort of eerie moving around in the darkness, and you hear sounds, and you turn the corner, you hear screams from around the corner, you turn the corner, and there is the talking skull, of course, the Jolly Roger that sets up the tail. But keep a weather eye open, mates, and hold on tight, with both hands, if you please. <laughs> and then you have a big surprise, and everybody screams and laughs in the dark as you go down the waterfall. People are going to get on a boat here and ride through the lagoon, and then as they get around here, we're going to take them down a waterfall, take them back into the past, into the days of the pirates, you know, where the Caribbean area was full of pirates. And... You start out with the pirates as skeletons. They're already dead as you've gone into this world. And then reveal this fantastic room where now the pirates come to life. Fire at will! Strike your colors, you bloomin' cockroaches! We'll see you to Davy Jones! We had everybody that had any, all the talent that you could find in this organization at that time were, were directed to the Pirates of the Caribbean. And it was just a symphony of wonderful, wonderful, creative people all working on what has turned out to be the greatest theme park attraction that's ever been done, in my view. We all started from not knowing what we were going to be getting into. The thing that has always been the marvelous thing working for Walt Disney was everybody pitched in and tried to figure out how to do it best. And if you came up with a better idea than somebody else, there wasn't any animosity or anything. They just, wow, that's a great idea, and we'd all work on that. And then said, later on, we'd maybe come up with something that was even better. Two of the individuals who really had a huge influence on Pirates of the Caribbean were Claude Coates and Mark Davis. And Mark Davis, of course, was one of Walt's nine old men, the animators. And Mark really contributed the fantastic vignettes to the attraction. All the gags, the wonderful characters that are brought to life in the ride. Claude Coates created the fantastic settings. Claude worked in animation as a layout and background artist. So Claude created the setting, Mark created the characters, and together you got Pirates of the Caribbean. He and Mark, I think, formed a great pair because Mark's ability with character was 
without peer. He had come out of animation, he understood character, and he could create poses that have lived forever in our minds. The auctioneer. What be I offered for this winsome wench? The dunking of the mayor in the well. No! No! On the other hand, it was Claude who put us through all these amazing environments. You know, I've often thought of the pirate ride as a descent into like a dreamlike state. And I think what Claude was able to do with lighting and color and spaces was phenomenal. And everything that you experience in there in terms of the tight elements inside the caverns opening up into the vast harbor and then down into the dungeon and so forth, all of these things are what Claude was an expert on. We always did a three-dimensional model before anything, because that's where we made our changes of the sets, the staging, the placement of the characters. We, we did everything on the models. It, the entire model was 40 feet long, the longest we had ever done. It's in one-inch scale, so the pirates were approximately six inches, each sculpted figure. And it wound around just like it does in the ride. We set it on sawhorses at Walt's eye height so that when he walked through, he would be able to see it more or less like the public saw it. And then later, we put him on a chair with wheels and wheeled him through as though he were in a boat. Here's a pirate laden with loot. He's trying to escape. He's got one foot on the dock and one foot on a rocky boat. Good luck to him. <laughs> well, he can't make it, or the show would go to pieces, you see. He has to stay there all the time and keep trying to get away. Blaine Gibson was brilliant at taking Mart's two-dimensional drawings and turning them into three-dimensional forms with the understanding of how all the mechanisms had to go into uh, each of these uh, characters. Having an animation background and working with some of the best animators in the world helped me when I began to get three-dimensional characters and to think in the terms of what they could do or not do. The idea of articulating dialogue with a figure seemed to me a little remote still at that time, and yet that did happen. We're working on a full-scale pirate. This will animate when we have it in the show, you know. He'll talk, and, and we'll have all kinds of uh, body movements and things. They carry on a regular little uh, story, you know. Then he'll be audio-animatronic. Audio-animatronic, that's right. Mm -hmm. Audio animatronics is the trademark for our animation system, and it implies the use of audio to create animation. And it actually used to be thousands of little audio beeps and clicks and beep boop, beep boop, beep boop, all along that would go out to the sensors, and the sensors would listen for the beep, and they would react to the beep. So as the figures moved, what the figures were hearing were all these beeps and moops and boops and moops and moops. Today, of course, it's all done with highly sophisticated digital equipment. We don't use it. We still call it audio animatronics, but there's no audio anymore. You know, they said it couldn't be done, and we didn't know different, so we did it. And we developed the skins, the flexible face skins and the hand skins, and those are all things that we just worked on and came up with something, and that's, you know, Walt wanted a shop where Anybody could do anything, and it give you a lot more flexibility to develop the shows. A lot of these heads that I did, it wasn't always Mark doing a sketch and then me, me trying to pick up a three-dimensional design from that, like the girl pulling up her skirt. I did that when he was on vacation. And uh, well, in fact, came in and says, now don't get too sexy with that, Blaine. But it wasn't sexy, you just lift it up a little bit and it was a long skirt. And also the auctioneer. That was just a made-up head. And that one was done before Mark did it, but he did them afterwards. I got a call from Walt, and he says, you know, I want you to do the script for the pirates. And I said, oh, Walt, I've never done any script, and I've done storyboarding and stuff like that. And he says, I want you to do the script. So I got my pirate hat on and started researching and got the Treasure Island picture to get the feeling of pirate jargon of vast, they're mating. Oh, 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 oh,
Still, if you plan to be rattled and loot, we cut behind your home. We kidnap and ravage and don't give a hoot. Bring us in. The very first live action film that Walt Disney made was Treasure Island, which was a pirate film. So, pirate lore, I think, has been part of this company, you know, since the dawn of at least live action films. In the mornings, before Walt used to go up to his office, he would wander through the shop, and he'd be working on something, he'd be standing there behind him, saying, good morning, what are you doing? And he appreciated the mechanical aspect of what we did. He understood animation, cartooning, filming, that kind of stuff. I mean, that was his bag. But what we did was magic to him. One of the things that Walt stressed was to try to create pirates as real looking as possible. My dad contacted a company that made glass eyes for people that lost one eye. And if you look at the pirates in that attraction and see the realism of those eyes, that's what really convinces us that there's more here than just a mechanical figure, because they're, they're human reproductions. Anybody who goes through the show will say, yes, I love the auction scene, but there's not a soul who goes to that show that doesn't look on top of the bridge and see the pirate's leg and see the hairs on his leg. They go, that is so cool. I had to put the hairs in one by one. We had everything we did, we did accurately and, and well. <laughs> the very day that Walt Disney died, I went out to the park shocked and I wandered as I did every week over to the windows of the pirate ride and I saw that for the first time ever the boats were going around and I, I rode the ride for the first time. There were no figures in it. It was dead silent and I was going on the greatest ride that would probably ever be built on the day that Walt Disney died. He was way ahead of his time in thinking of everything and he was a very gentle man and I think that his brother Roy, he and Roy, together were a marvelous team. And they really did bring to us a place you can go and relax and have fun. And there's not too many places like that left in the world. So they left us a great gift. Pirates has been one of our most successful and most popular attractions in history. It sort of defined what a Disney environmental attraction would be. It was the first one and has sort of been the benchmark. Whenever we do anything new, we, we sort of subconsciously say, how is it going to compare against pirates? And as a result of that popularity, we've included it in every park we've built so far. It's around the world. That boat becomes a dream port, uh, literally letting us as a group of 20 to descend down into a state of sort of altered consciousness. And I think that's the unique thing about rides, because everyone writes their own script. We don't know it's the mayor. We don't know that that's the captain, that's the auctioneer. We can interpret these things and make up our own story, and I think that's why these rides continue to delight over and over and over again. Just hold it.